This video introduces factorial analysis of variance, or ANOVA, which is a technique that you might use to evaluate whether some continuous outcome differs significantly between groups when those groups are based on two or more variables. So for example, does the amount of nitrate removed differ significantly between groups based on both material type and on two different levels of added phosphate? So you have soil at high phosphate, soil at low phosphate, wood chips at low phosphate and at high phosphate, for example. Each has its own group mean. We want to know, do those group means differ significantly from each other? So factorial ANOVA obviously has similarities with regular ANOVA, technically called one-way ANOVA, um, in that both of them divide the total variance into portions that are explained by the independent variable, this is the between groups mean square, and a remaining portion that's unaccounted which is called the within groups mean square. The statistical significance is calculated as the ratio of those two portions. But there are also similarities with multiple regression. Both techniques consider multiple independent variables, as well as potentially interactions between those variables. The difference is that multiple regression has at least one continuous independent variable, but that difference is much smaller than you might guess, as you'll learn by the end of this video. So what do you need for factorial ANOVA? Well, first, you need one continuous dependent variable, also called the outcome or the response. You want to know if this variable differs significantly among all the groups. Second, you need two or more independent variables, also called factors, groupings, predictors. Uh, these should be categorical and not continuous. They should have two or more levels in, in each of them. Third, the observations must be independent. And this typically means that you shouldn't have repeated measurements made on the same objects. If you do have that, well, you'll need to use a repeated measures ANOVA, which isn't covered in this video. Fourth, the dependent variable must be roughly normally distributed, which means more or less symmetrical and unimodal for each combination of the groups. The test isn't that sensitive to this, unless there's a, a, a good amount of, of skew in, in some of the variables. And fifth, the variance of the dependent variable should be roughly similar for each combination of groups. This is technically called the homogeneity of variances. So also note that the sample sizes end up being quite important, but there'll be much more on that later on. So what does factorial ANOVA do? Well, the first test is for the, the main effect, or the main effects. Whether there are significant differences between the means when grouped by each of the independent variables. So in our example, this could ask whether the mean of soil differs significantly from that of wood chips, whether the low phosphate mean differs significantly from the high phosphate mean. And the null hypothesis, as is common with null hypotheses, are that the group means are not different from each other, or that they come from populations with the same mean. The second thing that can be assessed is whether, there's, as a, whether there is a significant interaction between the, the, the factors. Uh, and this is where the mean difference is constant across all levels of the independent variables. And so the graph on the left shows an example with, with no interaction. The shift from low to high phosphate causes the same change in nitrate regardless of material. The shift from soil to wood chips, likewise, causes the same change in nitrate regardless of whether it's low or high phosphate. However, the graph on the right does show an interaction. Different combinations give you different outcomes. The effect of phosphate is much larger in wood chips than it is in soil. The effect of switching to wood chips is much larger when phosphate is high than when it's low. So the process of how this works is actually very similar to one-way ANOVA. The total variability, variance, or sum of squares, is first partitioned into the between groups component, which basically measures the differences between the group means. Smaller differences, meaning it's more likely that they came from the same population, bigger differences, meaning that's less likely. And there's also the within groups component, which sort of measures, basically measures the scatter within the groups. But because there are multiple independent va variable factors, the between groups variance is further partitioned into the, into the sum of squares for each factor, as well as the interactions. And finally, the statistical significance is assessed using f-tests on the ratio of the between groups mean square for each factor relative to the within groups mean square. So there end up being an F test for each factor and each interaction 
that your test might include. So how do you interpret the results? Well, if none are statistically significant, you can only say there's no significant difference and then no further action is required. If the interaction is significant, it's difficult to interpret the, the regular main effects because the effect of one factor depends on the value of the other. Instead, you can investigate something called the simple main effects, and that is the effect that one factor has at a constant level of the other factor or factors. So in the, in the two key tests, these are shown in a big list at the, the bottom of the output, um, along with some other pairwise comparisons. And the simple main effects are in, in the boxes there. For example, we have the, uh, a f the difference in means between wood chips and soil at the constant level of low phosphate, the difference in between high and low phosphate at the constant level of soil samples, and, and so forth. Well, if the interaction isn't significant, you can look at the regular main effects that are reported in the main output. You may also want to investigate the pairwise contrasts using a two-key test like you would with a, a regular one-way ANOVA. Now, in, in factorial ANOVA, there can be a lot of possible comparisons, uh, even more so when the factors have more than the two levels in this, in the, we're using in the example here, or when there are three independent variables or, or more. So factorial ANOVA can get really complex. And what you end up reporting will depend on the scientific questions that you're trying to answer. But in general, as, as with sort of all these tests, there's two components. The first is the effect size. How important is the independent variable? This is really crucial, and it's measured by looking at the means of the samples and especially at the differences between sample means. And this is what we really care about. We want to know how big of an effect does something have. You should also report the statistical significance, and when you do that, give for any test that has it the F statistic, the two degrees of freedom, and the p-value for that test. And this basically tells us not how important the effect is, but how likely it is to have occurred if the null hypothesis was true. So it gives us some sense of how unexpected or surprising this effect is. And so you should report all the statistical results for the primary test. Don't omit any factors or interactions when reporting your summary. Um, if you run a test with two fact three factors and an interaction, don't then just report two of them because that is going to sort of skew your results and, and potentially run into problems with researcher degrees of freedom. Okay, so here's the big, big caution about sample size that I, I briefly mentioned towards the beginning. So factorial ANOVA gets complicated when sample sizes are unequal. So it really works best for experimental data where you can control and make sure that every combination has the same sample size. So that's our best case scenario, the balanced design. All sample sizes are equal, all combinations of independent variable factors have, in this case, 20 samples, the same number in all of them. If the sample sizes are unequal, the design is no longer balanced. It's called unbalanced now. And so the medium case, the second best case, is unbalanced but still proportional. So the sizes are different, but there's consistent ratios between the factors. So for example, wood chips in this example always have one and a half times as many samples as soil. High phosphate is always twice as many samples as low phosphate. The worst, but probably most common, type of unbalanced design is the unbalanced and disproportional design where everything's unequal and there aren't constant ratios. So this is probably what you'll run into if you have unbalanced data. But why are unbalanced designs problematic? Well, when the design is balanced, that means that each factor is independent of the other factors. There's no correlation between them. But you might be wondering, well, how can, what do we mean by correlation? The factor levels are words, like soil or wood chips, or, or low or high. Well, imagine we convert them to numbers. So we give soil a zero, we give wood chips a one, zero for low phosphate, one for high phosphate, so forth. We can then plot the data, and you can see that there are 20 zero zeros, 20 zero ones, 20 one zeros, 20 one ones. Um, there's no correlation. All four have 20 data points in them. But when the design is unbalanced and disproportionate, there ends up being some correlation between the different factors. So we'll convert them to 0 and 1 again, 
But now we only have 10 data points in the lower left 0, 0 category. There's 15 in the 0, 1, there's 20 in the 1, 0, and there's 25 in the upper right category with 1, 1, that's wood chips and high phosphate. So there's some correlation here. For example, if we know that the material is soil, which is zero on the horizontal axis, we also know that it's a bit more likely that phosphate will be high. If we know that phosphate is high, we also know that we're more likely to be looking at wood chips. So why is this a problem? Well, the correlation between factors means that it's impossible to accurately partition the sum of squares. Because we know, you know, just knowing something about whether it's wood chips or soil tells us some information about a different factor, they're, they're intertwined in some way. We can't distinguish them fully. So consider the, the balance design. There's no correlation between the variables or their interaction. So these, these circles, in a schematic way, show the sum of squares for each. The larger purple circle is the sum of squares for the material, wood chip or soil. The medium orange circle on the right is the sum of squares for phosphate, low or high. And the smaller circle with the color gradient on the bottom is the sum of squares for the interaction. And they don't, they don't, there's no correlation, so they're all independent. They're all their own circle. There's no overlapping. In an unbalanced but proportional design, there's no correlation between the two variables. They don't overlap, but there is some correlation with the interaction. So those circles overlap a little bit. And I won't talk much more about this. But we will focus more on the unbalanced and disproportional design. Um, there's correlations between the variables and with the interactions. Those are all indicated with the overlapping of these circles. So some of the overlapping area means that the sum of squares for the material and the phosphate are correlated with each other. Some of that should go to the purple circle and some to the orange factor, but it's impossible to know how much goes to each. So there's a couple ways to deal with this. One is just a caution is that the default ANOVA functions in R partitions the sum of squares in a sequential way, which I'll show in a second. This is called the type one sum of squares. And this causes problems because the results that you get depend on the order that the variables are entered into the function. Obviously, this is not a good thing. So in this function, material is first, so it gets all of its sum of squares. When, you, when they're partitioned, they're first partitioned by saying how much is explained by material. And then the next step is to say how much is explained by phosphate, taking into account we've already used some of the sum of squares for material. So phosphate gets kind of the remaining ones. And finally, interaction gets what's, what's left over. But if you swap the order and put phosphate first, well, phosphate gets all of its sum of squares. Material, the purple circle, gets its, but not including the ones that were already given to phosphate. And inter the interaction, again, gets the leftovers. So in this way, you will end up overestimating the significance of the factor listed first. It's being given given in, in, in a sort of a colloquial sense, some of squares that are not actually influenced by that variable because some of that overlapping area should go to one and some to the other. But in this case, we either give it all to one or all to the other. So there's two alternative methods. First, if the interaction isn't significant, you can use something called the type two sum of squares. In it, each factor basically gets the sum of squares that is unique just to it. And that overlapping wedge is ignored and not given to anyone. So the material in purple gets the sum of squares for the material category after removing the part that is correlated with phosphate that overlaps. Likewise, phosphate gets its sum of squares after removing the overlapping portion with material. Now if the interaction is significant, it gets more complicated. There's this type three sum of squares and in it, each factor, as well as the interaction, are allocated the sum of squares unique just to that component. Any overlapping or shared sum of squares are ignored. So for example, the sum of squares for material is that after accounting for the sum of squares for both phosphate and the interaction. And so if you think, if you recall back to uh, multiple regression, this sounds quite similar because it in fact is exactly what multiple regression does. It looks at the effect of one variable 
after accounting for the effects of the other ones. Now both of these methods take a conservative approach. Type 3 is a bit more so than type 2. You can see that the purple and the orange circle areas are smaller in type 2 and even smaller in type 3. And this means that these methods will underestimate the statistical significance compared to what we could do if we could actually partition the sum of squares. But that's the penalty for an unbalanced design. And it's considered to be better to be conservative in this way than to go the opposite direction, which would raise our risk of falsely finding statistical significance. So if you have an unbalanced design, beware of the standard R ANOVA functions and use alternatives with either type 2 or type 3 sum of squares, or use something called the general linear model, which I'll cover in a future video. Welcome back. Uh, this video continues the discussion of regression methods in this class, and the goal here is to extend linear regression to situations where some of the assumptions that you learned about in the standard or ordinary least squares regression are not met. And so here I'll introduce generalized least squared regression, and this comes up most often when working with time series data. So to recap, linear regression and ordinary least squared in particular, uh, it describes the dependence of one variable, traditionally on the y-axis, on another variable, traditionally on the x-axis. And so ordinary least squared, or OLS, regression fits a line um, by minimizing the squared distance between our best fit line and all points, um, and that distance between the expected line and the best and the observed point is called the residual, typically given the, the Greek letter epsilon. So I covered linear regression assumptions in a previous video, so I'm not going to go into much detail here. But we're going to focus on this second assumption here, that the points must be independent of each other. In other words, that the residuals should be, not, should be uncorrelated with residuals of the previous point or previous points. So we'll talk about what that means in a second, but generalized least squared regression is a method that you can use when there is some significant correlation between residuals. And this most often occurs with time series data, and this video will focus primarily on that topic. Uh, but GLS regression can also be used in the case of, say, spatial correlation of the residuals and similar things. So here's an example of linear regression using data that comes from a time series. So here, looking to see if there's a relationship between atmospheric oxygen um, and maximum insect size. And in this case, it's wing length, which is log transformed to make it less skewed. And so this data is a time series because the measurements, both of oxygen and insect size, come from successive geological time periods. Well, if you just look at the regular scatter plot here, it seems like there's a relationship. It ends up that this relationship is significant with ordinary least squared regression. But if you look at the, the points and their relationship to the best fit line there, aka the residuals, it does seem that the residuals tend to be positive at small oxygen values, the points are pretty much all above the line. A lot of the residuals are negative at intermediate values, and they might be positive again at high values of oxygen. It's also possible the variance of the residuals is not constant for all oxygen values, but we're going to ignore that. Um, but the fact that there could be some correlation between the residuals, that is, if one residual tends to be positive, the ones around it also tend to be positive, that could violate our regular or ordinary least squares regression assumptions. So that correlation between residuals is something called autocorrelation. Um, and a scatter plot here of the residuals, say at position x, against the residuals at position x plus 1 suggests that there's pretty strong autocorrelation among the residuals. Uh, just, as, just to sort of explain what this is in a bit more detail, so that that bottom left point there is the residual of the seventh value in the data set, that's its x-coordinate, and the y-coordinate is the residual of the eighth value. So essentially you've just taken the residuals on the x and plotted it against the residuals shifted or lagged by one unit on the y-axis. So in this case it's lagged by one position, our residuals, but it's possible that you can lag by two, you can shift them by two positions, or three, and you can look at the correlation between your actual residuals and the residuals shifted one over, or two, or three, or four, at all these sort of lag levels. And you'll see that in a second. 
So I'm going to very briefly go over the theoretical justification for how generalized least squared or GLS regression works, uh, but really spend most of the time on the practical decisions that you're going to need to make in order to perform this method. So basically, um, GLS regression works in the idea that we can transform the residuals in some way to remove this correlation structure, this autocorrelation that you might have. And so while ordinary least squares minimizes the linear distance between residuals, generalized least squares uh, minimizes the distance relative to the covariance of those residuals. And if you've watched some of the early videos, you may recall that this thing called the Mahalanobis distance is a pretty good measure of multivariate distance after taking into account some covariance structure. So GLS regression, basically what it's doing is minimizing the squared Mahalanobis distance of the residuals. So the math is all behind the scenes and we'll let the computer take care of that. The main decision you need to make um, when doing generalized least squared is choosing an appropriate correlation structure for the residuals. And the general form of this model, uh, for time series at least, is called an autoregressive moving average or ARMA model. Uh, it can have an autoregressive component, a moving average component, or a combination of the two. And points in an autoregressive model are influenced by the position of the previous point or points. In a moving average model, they're influenced by the previous error term or terms. Um, they can be influenced by just the one immediately preceding, in which case it's called a first order model or they can be influenced by the preceding two values, the one before and the one the time before that. That's a second order model, and so forth. You can go three for three orders, or four steps back, or, or a number back. But normally it'll be lower order for our data. So I'll demonstrate these two types of processes with a simple example, sort of moving a forward example. Imagine there's some time series uh, has a long-term average, um, but there's also some hypothetical error terms that are randomly distributed around it. So in an autoregressive process, the point at time 2 actually is still above our long-term average line, even though the error term is, is negative, um, because the position that we can calculate is a combination of the, the it depends, it's a combination of the T2 error term, um, and the location of the point at the previous time, T1. And note, you know, that the exact position will depend on the strength and the direction of autocorrelation, which is this uh, phi parameter in the equation. And of course, normally the procedure works backwards to estimate all these parameters from the data, because we don't know the parameters beforehand. Um, rather than, you know, I'm just sort of calculating this forward example as, as, a, as an illustration of how things work. Well, at, at time t3, we have a similar equation. It's the point is based on the average, the error term at time 3, plus some contribution from where it was at time 2, where the point was at time 2. And so it actually still remains above the line, even though the error term here and at time 2 were both negative, still because of the influence of the t2 point itself. And that t2 point, remember, was influenced by where the t1 point was. And so what this means is that the effect that, say, an initial point position has gets dragged out over time, even though it doesn't actually show up in the equation directly for um, the T3 position. And so, for example, at point T4 or at time T5, if we continued our time series out, um, the initial T1 point might actually still have some leftover influence, although the size of that influence is going to decrease gradually as you get further and further away from a point. So in a moving average process, the point at time t3 is instead influenced by the error term at t3, which is negative, and the error term at t2. So that's the difference. It's not the, where the point was. It's what the sort of hypothetical error term might have been. Um, and unlike in the autoregressive model now, that t1 error or point has no effect anymore. Our error terms, the blue lines, are independent of one another. And so this difference, the fact that the the, in an autoregressive model, there is a gradually decreasing effect of a point versus a moving, moving average model only incorporating exactly the point just before it. Um, that's going to be important when we later determine whether the data is autoregressive or a moving average. And just to reiterate, 
um, this example is, is a first order model. So the equations that are down there only include some contribution from the time just before. But there can be higher order models where the equation includes two extra terms, you know, one from T1 and one from T0, for example, going back two steps, three steps, or more. So how do you actually identify the type and the order of autoregressive or moving average models? Uh, well, one way is to use the autocorrelation function and the partial autocorrelation function, which I'll explain here. So an autocorrelation function plot is, is this thing which has vertical lines, um, and each vertical line is the correlation coefficient between the residuals and the residuals at various lag values. So you take the actual residuals and see how they correlate to the residuals shifted one step. That's lag one. Um, or you shift them, and that's what you saw a few slides ago. Or you compare the actual residuals to the residuals lagged or shifted over by two positions. That's point two and so forth. So the dashed blue lines here are estimates of statistical significance, um, and so the first two lags will ignore lag zero because that's just the residuals against themselves, and so that's why the correlation is one. Um, but the time lag one and lag two are both above the blue line, so that suggests there's significant autocorrelation. But one thing, the most important thing to note with this in our data here is that the, there's a gradual decay. The autocorrelation function sort of gradually decreases and then it reaches and sort of fluctuates around zero, basically. And this gradual decay is typical of an autoregressive process because, as you saw just before, there's a gradual decrease in, in the influence of earlier points. So that the partial correlation function or the partial autocorrelation function um, shows the partial correlation between the residuals and the residuals at various lag values. And so partial correlation, if you you can refer back to the previous video if you want more information, but basically it's it's the correlation after accounting for the effect of the previous autocorrelations. So anyhow, in this case you see it drops off very rapidly, um, and the only significant partial autocorrelation is at lag one. Um, and that indicates that a first-order autoregressive model is best. So AR1 is the way we typically write first-order autoregressive. So these AR1 models are likely going to be some of the more common ones you would find, um, but it's definitely important to investigate this rather than just assuming. So in general, if the autocorrelation function decays gradually and the partial autocorrelation function drops off abruptly, what you do is you choose an autoregressive model, and you choose one that has an order p, whether that's first order or second order or, or higher, um, that is equal to the largest significant partial autocorrelation lag. So for example, this is just a schematic graph that so don't have the dashed lines for significance or anything. Um, but here you can see that there's a gradual ACF decay and only a single significant PACF lag, and this suggests first order autoregressive or AR1 model. Depending on the nature of the autocorrelation, um, the decay may alternate between positive and negative, um, but this is still typical of an AR1 process um, because the absolute magnitude is decaying gradually and only one PACF lag is significant. So if a higher order process like AR2, it'll have two significant lags on the partial autocorrelation plot. It might be positive and negative, both positive, both negative, there's some combination, but the decay in the autocorrelation function might be less clear than before. So if you see the reverse pattern where the autocorrelation function drops below significance really rapidly, but the partial autocorrelation function decays gradually, so the reverse of before, you choose a moving average model and you choose one that has an order Q, whether it's first order, second order, so forth, equal to the largest significant autocorrelation lag. So this example here um, suggests a first order moving average, or MA1 process, because there's only one significant ACF lag, and the PACF decreases gradually. Like before, the partial autocorrelation function can alternate back and forth, but this is still MA1 because there's only one significant autocorrelation lag. And like before as well, 
higher order processes can be harder to diagnose. This example has two significant autocorrelation lags. Um, could be an MA2 model. So as you may have noticed in the last couple slides, sometimes these higher order models can be difficult to distinguish just from the plots alone. Um, and this might be especially true for models that combine both autoregressive and moving average. So how can you tell then what is the best one to use? Well, a solution it could often be to run a variety of GLS regressions, choose different correlation structures, run one with AR1, uh, run one with MA1, and one with an ARMA model that combines both, and then compare the the sort of the model fit um, with Akiiki Information Criterion, AIC. You can refer back to the Maximum Likelihood video for more information on what that really is. Uh, you can use that to select the best model. So in the case of the insect example, comparison of, of several models suggests and in fact confirms that AR1 is, is the best model, the best candidate, has the lowest AIC value. Um, AR2 isn't quite as good. Um, the moving average ones are really not very good. They're much higher in AIC. Um, and an ARMA model, an ARMA 1-1, which is first order auto regression and first order moving average, also not quite as good as the AR1 model. So when reporting your results, you should note that you, you use generalized least squared regression. And also you should state what correlation structure you use. You may want to justify why you chose that one over some of the other ones that could be possible. Um, you know, give the AIC values if you did that. Um, discuss the autocorrelation plot. You know, typically um, you would not include this in a paper, but it depends on, on sort of how difficult it was to choose the correlation structure. Of course, you would want to give the regression coefficient for the parameter. Uh, that's sort of the equivalent of the slope of the regression line. If you're doing a multiple regression, um, you give the coefficients for each um, dependent variable, independent variable that you care about. Um, of course, give the p-value. GLS regression doesn't calculate an r-squared value like ordinary least squares, um, so there's nothing to report there. And it's also difficult to include a graph because just making the scatter plot is going to ignore the correlation structure in the residuals. It could be misleading in terms of the relationship that it shows. And also just to wrap up with the insect example that we started with, although the ordinary least squares originally suggested that there was actually a significant effect of oxygen on insect size, once you account for the time series nature of the data with a GLS regression using AR1 correlation structure, that actually suggests that the relationship isn't actually significant after all. Welcome back. This video is going to introduce multiple linear regression, which is an extension of the simple linear regression that you might be more familiar with and that we've talked about more earlier in this class. So just a quick recap of linear regression, which to differentiate it, so, it from multiple regression is often called simple linear regression. So as an example, maybe we think that the pH of seawater is one of the controls on the boron calcium ratio measured in shells. So that's what the graph here implies. So as our goal is a prediction, or in this case, as we may think that there is a causal relationship where one influences the other, we'll fit a linear model with some intercept called beta 0, some slope called beta 1, and then minimize the sum of squares of the residuals, this error residual term here. Um, remember, residuals are the distance from each point down or up to the regression line itself. So as you can see, this does an okay job of explaining the relationship. It's not a great job, but there's definitely a lot of scatter around this line. So, in fact, the best fit um, relationship is this equation here. And the R squared is 0.33. That indicates that only 33% of the variation in boron calcium can be accounted for by changes in, in pH. So that's, that's not great. But in many situations, there's more than one potential controlling factor. After all, the natural world is, is a complicated place. So in the case of the previous relationship between pH and boron calcium, it turns out that there are three different species of organisms in this study. And as you see from the graph, they each differ quite substantially in their, their boron calcium ratios, regardless of what the pH is. So if you add species identity as a second independent variable along with the pH, the ability to predict boron calcium increases quite a lot, 
In fact, the R squared is up to 0.92, which is really remarkable. So most of the time when you think of regression, you think of continuous variables. But in this case, note that one of our variables, species, is a categorical one. So it is all right to include categorical variables as well as continuous ones um, as an independent variable in multiple regression. Just as an, as an aside, and interestingly, linear regression, as well as ANOVA and t-tests that you've learned about before, are actually all special cases of a more generic method called general linear models. So without getting into the mathematics of multiple regression, it works in much the same way as simple linear regression. The model coefficients are fit um, in a way that minimizes the sum of squares of the residuals in the y direction. So same as, as, as simple linear regressions, just now, instead of one slope coefficient, we have multiple regression coefficients um, that end up being harder to interpret a little bit, as, as you'll see in a second. So what are the goals and the requirements of multiple regression? Well, the dependent variable, which is the one that you want to predict, or the one that's being influenced by the other ones, uh, must be a continuous variable. Um, and in this case, there are multiple independent variables, at least one of which has to be continuous, but there can be a mix of continuous and categorical uh, predictors or independent variables. So there's two purposes, possible purposes for, for regression, multiple regression. First, you can create a model to predict the dependent variable from these multiple independent variables. Uh, we won't discuss this sort of model uh, prediction much uh, at this point in the class, but there are important considerations when comparing and, and choosing modules that you will hear about somewhat later on, not in this video. Second, and the thing that we'll focus more on, is that you can do hypothesis testing um, to assess whether the independent variables each have a significant influence on the dependent variable after you account for all the other independent variables and their effects. I'll explain that more in, in more detail later on. So philosophically speaking, you shouldn't mix these two goals. For example, if you're comparing and choosing models for prediction, sort of the first possibility, don't also treat it as hypothesis testing. You know, so it's not hypothesis testing of the importance of the variables, uh, because if you're doing a whole bunch of model selection and comparison, of course you're choosing a really good model. So you end up with researcher degrees of freedom that you've heard about before, elevated false positive risks. So finally, if you are doing hypothesis testing, the null hypothesis is that each independent variable, considered on its own, has no effect, where its coefficient is zero, after you account for the effects of the other variables. So I've said a few times now how the coefficients in multiple regression describe how one independent variable affects the dependent variable after accounting for the effects of all the other independent variables. But what does that actually mean when you're interpreting you know, the results? The interpretation of these multiple regression coefficients can be a little tricky. So here's a, here's a made-up example where shell growth rate is influenced by both water temperature and water pH. So the regression equation is, is given there. So growth is 0 0.03 times temperature plus 0 0.5 times pH. And I've graphed temperature versus growth but I've color-coded the points to indicate the, the, P value, uh, the pH value. And so what does this coefficient of 0 0.5 for pH mean? Well, it means that at any given temperature, one unit of pH increase will increase the growth rate by uh, 0 0.5 units of growth. Or, in this case, pH doesn't change that much, so let's say 0.1 unit of pH increase will increase the growth rate by 0 0.05 units. So I added the regression lines for the effective temperature at a pH of 7.7 .7 and at a pH of 7.8. And what you'll notice is that no matter what the temperature is, there's always a 0.05 unit growth rate difference in those two lines. So if we know pH on its own only, we can't predict growth rate. But if we know temperature as well, we can predict growth rate from these two together. So for example, at a temperature of 30 degrees, Increasing pH from 7.7 .7 to 7.8 will increase our growth. Will increase the growth rate from around I don't know 4.73 to 4.78 units, 0 0.05 units. But at a temperature of 23 degrees, the same increase in pH will increase the growth rate from about 4.54 or so to 4.59 ish. So notice that the the 
the actual growth rate is a function of both, but the change in pH always has the same relative effect on growth after you account for the fact that growth is itself influenced by temperature. So the typical phrasing for this would be something like, you know, after accounting for the effects of temperature, a one unit pH increase would increase growth rates by 0 0.5 units. So one additional caution, because the coefficients in this case indicate the effect that it would have after accounting for the other independent variables, the value of that coefficient will definitely change even to the extent that its sign might change in a model when you include additional or different independent variables. Now let's say we add salinity as a variable. Well now pH maybe won't have an effect of 0 0.5, it might be bigger or, or less than, than that effect now. It can even be the case where, this, where it might have a, a statistically significant effect in one model, but that effect might be not significant in a different model with different independent variables. So the effect that an uh, independent variable has is, in this case, context dependent. It is only true after you've accounted for all the other independent variables and their effects. So the same type of inference applies when one of the independent variables is categorical, like the case with the species identities here. So in this case, the categories tend to be sort of in, in, the, in, in the mathematics of the, of the equation, converted into something which is often called a dummy variable that has values of 0 and 1. So we'll just call one species 0 and the other species 1, you know, arbitrarily. Um, in this example, when there's more than two levels, there's three species, um, they are treated as, as multiple pairs of 0 and 1. So R does this alphabetically, so the species C wool is 0, and the other ones are 1 in, in this pair, as you can see from the coefficients. So if you look at the coefficients in, in the results table in R, you notice that they're minus 63 and minus 132, and what that tells us is that N um, the species, has a boron calcium ratio on average 63.335 units lower than C wool after you account for the effects of pH. The lines aren't exactly parallel, but we're sort of looking at an average once you account for the fact that pH itself controls boron calcium. Um, and likewise, O um has a boron calcium ratio about 132 units lower than C wool, also after we've accounted for the fact that pH already has some effect itself. So, so far the examples have considered independent variables that act completely in, in isolation from each other. So at the, the size of the effect of independent variable 2 is the same regardless of what value the other independent variable or variables have. So for example, in, in the graph here, a one unit increase in independent variable 2, say going from the pink line to the blue line, always causes a one unit increase in our dependent variable on the y-axis um, and that's regardless of what value the independent variable 1 on the x-axis has. But sometimes the two independent variables, or the predictors, can interact with each other so the size of, a, of the effect that one of them has differs depending on the value of the other one. So as an example in the graph here, you'll notice that a one unit increase in independent variable 2, again going from the pink line up to the blue line, might cause a one unit increase in the dependent variable when the independent variable one on the x-axis has a value of say zero but if the independent variable one has a value of three on the x-axis the distance between the pink line and the blue line is bigger so in this case the effect of the independent variable interacts with each other so that the, the amount of change from one is a function of the other one as well it gets complicated to explain. So some warnings about interaction terms. You should probably have a good theoretical justification before you look at the data to even think about assessing interactions. Like why should there be an interaction between these two? If you have some theory beforehand, or if you expect this to be the case, by all means look at it. But if not, then maybe avoid looking at it. Um, Multiple regression has a lot of opportunities for researcher degrees of freedom. You can look at various combinations of independent variables with or without interactions. There's a lot of things you can do. Um, and so you should be very careful that you're not hunting around for significant effects, for example.
And along the same lines, you should often beware if you find a significant interaction, like an independent variable one and two interact with each other, but on their own, each one is not significant. That could be a valid finding, but again, you should have some good justification for why that's the case and be aware of these sort of the issues of researcher degrees of, of freedom. So very briefly about prediction, multiple linear regression gives an R-squared value just like simple linear regression. And again, in the same way, it indicates the proportion of variation that's accounted for by the entire model with all the predictors that have gone into it, all the independent variables that are included. So adding independent variables always increases the raw R-squared. The more variables you get, the easier it is to find some fit that's going to fit exactly every point, essentially. So multiple regression generally uses something called the adjusted R-squared. Uh, this indicates, or this includes some correction to take, a, take account of the number of independent variables that are included. Um, basically, what the adjusted R-squared is doing is it's saying it's assessing whether the addition of a new independent variable actually increases the model fit by a greater degree than you'd expect just from chance. So the assumptions of multiple linear regression are the same as those of linear regression, simple linear regression. And I'll, sort of, I'll run through them again just to remind you. Uh, so the dependent variable should have a linear relationship with each of the independent variables. What that means is it shouldn't be a curved relationship. There shouldn't be significant or notable outliers. It can be no relationship. It can be like a big cloud of points, but it just can't be a curved one. So note this doesn't apply to the categorical ones. Of course, they're not going to have a linear relationship because they only have two values or, or three values. Um, um, but the other ones should have a linear relationship, the continuous ones. Um, secondly, the uh, observations should be independent of one another and representative of a larger population. So in this case, you should really beware of time series data or data that has some kind of spatial organization collected you know, along a spatial transect or something like that. Because there is a risk there that those observations are not independent, that they're actually somewhat related to their neighboring points in time or in space. So third, the variance of points in the y direction on our graph should be fairly constant at all points along the x-axis. So to evaluate this, again, you would want to make a scatter plots, however many is necessary, to compare the dependent variable to all the different independent ones. And watch out for triangle or, or, or wedge-shaped distributions of points. That's generally a bad sign, I mean, which, because it shows you that the variance um, is not constant at all points along the x-axis. And finally, the distribution of the residuals, the distance between the points and the line around the regression line, um, should be close to, or mostly, a normal distribution. It doesn't have to be exact, but as long as it's symmetrical and, and relatively uh, unimodal, you're, you're okay. So when reporting your results, you should describe the complete model you used, all of the variables that went into it. Um, really, if, you're tr if you tried out a bunch of things, that's fine. You know, just talk about how it's an exploratory data analysis and mention all the different models you tried and all the different variables you looked at. Um, because of the issue of researcher degrees of freedom and, and the possibility of looking around and hunting for significant results. So if you report the regression coefficients, for the independent variables of interest. You may be not interested in all the variables. Maybe some of them you just want to account for because you know they might confound the, the analysis and you really only care about some of them. That's, that's fine, you just, but you should report those ones. Again, report the p-values for each of the coefficients that you are interested in interpreting. Um, you should report the adjusted r-squared for the entire model, even if you're doing hypothesis testing, just to give the reader a sense of of how good this model is as an overall explanatory thing in, in general. There are some downsides to R-squared, but it's, a, it's an okay measure of, of model fit. And depending on the nature of your data, you can include scatter plots showing that data. It, it's hard if you have many continuous predictors and many continuous independent variables. Um, so for more complicated models, it's hard to do that. But you've seen some examples of scatter plots in the, in the video here. So very briefly, uh, running a multiple uh, regression in R is, is almost exactly the same as simple linear regression. It's the same LM or linear model function, the same formula style input with the dependent variable as a function using the tilde symbol of the independent variables, but the only difference is that you can use 
You can include each of the independent variables separated by a plus sign, however many you have. And you can have, you know, normally you don't have more than two or three or, or four, but in theory you can have as many as you want. It gets hard to interpret in, in those cases. Um, the order of them doesn't matter in this case. You can put them in, in in whatever order you want. And so, again, make sure to save the results as an object so you can see the important information later on. And so, to run a, a model with an interaction between the two independent variables, use the, the star, the multiplication star. So this would test how variable 1 affects it, how variable 2 affects it, and also the interaction between those two. In theory, you can have interactions between three or, or more. I, I tried it, and it, it, R accepts this. Um, but in practice, that's going to be really complicated to interpret, so you don't often do that. So as a final word, although running multiple regressions is, is pretty straightforward, in, in R at least, you should pay close, some, uh, close attention to the assumptions. Um, for more complicated models, this will require a lot of assessing things with scatter plots. You should also think carefully about your interpretations, especially if you have interaction terms, and beware of the researcher degrees of freedom and the possibility of doing, you know, looking through a bunch of different models to find one that works, which is not a good thing to do. This video builds upon the previous one, which covered factorial ANOVA. So like that topic, nested ANOVA is a method for comparing a single variable between groups, but in this case, those groups have subgroups nested within them. So what are nested factors? Well, it's a, it's a sampling structure that's hierarchical. So there's higher level or broader groups, and they have smaller subgroups nested within them. So here's an example on, this, on the slide here, um, where the higher level group is, say, landscape type, whether it's farmland or forest, and the nested subgroups are the individual lakes, one through eight. And lake one has a bunch of measurements in it, and lake two has a bunch of measurements, and, and so forth. So importantly, the fact what makes this nested is that the items, the lakes, occur in only one of the broader group levels. So lakes 1 through 4 occur in farmland, lakes 5 through 8 occur only in forest. You don't have one lake in, in both types. So this differs from the, the crossed design, which was in the previous video on factorial ANOVA. In crossed designs, all levels of one of the factor occur within all levels of the other factor. So, for example, there, there are soil samples in both low and high phosphate. Wood chip samples occur in both phosphate levels. And low phosphate samples occur in both soil and wood chips, and, and so forth. But why bother with this, this structure? Why go to the trouble of dealing with this, this extra level of complexity? Why can't we just ignore these subgroupings and just do a regular ANOVA, a one-way ANOVA, or even a, a t-test? Just, you know, group up all the data from farmland lakes and all the data from forest lakes and, and, and run it then. Well, to understand why this is not really a good thing to do, think back to the assumptions of ANOVA, or really the assumptions of any statistical test. So because there's structure in the data, because of this nested structure, it's quite probable that some lakes just have inherently higher or lower clarity values than other lakes do. So as a result, the fact that we have multiple measurements from one lake, there's this nested structure, means that many of these individual measurements are not independent of one another. And that violates the assumptions. Almost all statistical tests require that the data points are independent of one another. So this is something called pseudo-replication. Because the measurements are independent, that means that the degrees of freedom, which are basically the sample size, um, are too high, they're incorrectly too high, and that makes the test appear more statistically significant than it really should be. So we're increasing our chance of getting a false positive signal. So the exact goals of nested ANOVA depend on the sampling structure, what groups there are, how they're nested. The goals also depend on the scientific questions you're trying to ask. But, you know, given all that, most often we want to test for significant differences among our higher level group, but often don't really care about the subgroups nested within them. Now that's, not, of course, not always the case, but you know, here's a very simple example where there's two levels of main groups. We have the farmland and the forest. In this example, we might care if clarity, water clarity, differs significantly between farmland and forest regions, which are the two levels.
um, but we might not care about the differences among all the lakes in those regions. We may not care if lake 1 and 2, 3, 4 differ from each other. So in this situation, the null hypothesis for the higher level groups is that they both have the same mean value. So that's a pretty typical null hypothesis for ANOVA. So I also said that, you know, perhaps we don't really care about the subgroups themselves. But what does that actually mean in a, in a more formal sense? So this nested structure introduces the idea of fixed, fixed effects versus random effects. The distinction between these two types of effects is somewhat fluid, somewhat diffuse. Um, it may depend on the questions you're asking. So in some situations, something might be a fixed effect, but with a different type of question, that same thing might be a random effect. So what, what are these fixed and random effects? Well, the example in this video, region type, which is farmland versus forest, is being treated as a fixed effect. Generally speaking, to identify something as a fixed effect, you can look for, for example, the levels in that effect represent the entire population. So that could be one thing to look for, and or the goal that you have is to test for differences between those levels. So in the example we have here uh, in this video, uh, there probably are more types of land use than just farmland and forest, so that doesn't really meet the first one. Farmland and forest probably aren't the entirety of land use types in the population. But we're treating it as a fixed effect regardless because our goal is to test for differences between farmland and forest. So you have to, sort of, you have to treat it as a fixed effect. Also, sort of generally speaking, to identify random effects, you want to have things where the levels within it are random samples from a much larger population and or you're not really interested in the differences between those levels. They might be kind of nuisance noise in, in, your, in your data. Well, in our example in this video, both of those cases are perhaps met. I mean, it's a hypothetical example. Unless there's exactly four lakes in each region, we have a sample of lakes from a bigger group of, of lakes. Um, but more importantly, in this case, perhaps we don't care about the differences between the lakes, so we're going to treat it as a random effect. So if the nested subgroups are being treated as a random effect, the null hypothesis for them is that the different subgroup levels don't add overall variance to the model. But really the statistical results for random effects typically aren't even reported um, or, or investigated in this type of study. Now, in contrast, if these nested subgroups are fixed effects, say we actually do care about the differences among the lakes, we have some reason for you know, wanting to know if lake one and two differ from each other and differ from lake three and so forth, we could treat them as fixed effects. And the null hypothesis then would be the same as for the main group, that the, the means of each level in our category is equal. So what is the requirements for nested ANOVA? What are the assumptions that this test is, is using that we have to make sure that our data meet? Well, first you're gonna need one continuous dependent variable also called the outcome or the response. Your question really is, does this variable differ significantly among the groups? So this is what you have in all ANOVAs. You also need two or more independent variables, but in this case, they have to be nested. Uh, this is the main distinction between factorial ANOVA, where in factorial ANOVA, the groups are, are fully crossed, so they, all levels occur in all levels. Here, they the levels of our subgroups don't occur in all levels of our main groups. Uh, the individual observations or measurements that you're making must be independent of one another. Um, this is partly what the nested structure is dealing with, the fact that there is a structure that makes them not independent unless you deal with random effects, for example. But the other thing to look for is to make sure that there aren't repeated measurements on the same object or the same the same thing. Um, this is one common way of non-independence that you have to deal with otherwise. So the dependent variable must be more or less normally distributed um, for each combination of the groups in the independent variable. And there's also the homogeneity of variances assumption uh, in which the variance of the dependent variable should be similar for each combination of groups in the independent variable. And these are all assumptions and requirements that are, that are typical of, of all ANOVAs, really. And finally, it's important to have a balanced 
design. And this means that there's the same number of subgroups nested within each main group. They're not the same actual items, but there should be the same number of groups within each main group. And there should be an equal sample size in each subgroup. So if the design is unbalanced, if you don't meet these assumptions, there are methods that try to deal with that. Uh, they're a bit beyond the scope of this video. You may want to consider other approaches instead of ANOVA even, such as something called mixed effects modeling, which I'll, I'll mention briefly at the end. So what does nested ANOVA do? Well, it starts with the general ANOVA approach that is partitioning variants or sum of squares into different components. We have the between groups, the between subgroups, and the within groups component. Now after that, we will calculate F statistics, like is done in regular ANOVA, one-way ANOVA, also in factorial ANOVA. But here, the calculation depends on the structure, whether it's fixed effects or random effects. So, if the subgroups are fixed effects, the F statistic for the main group is the between groups mean square divided by the within groups mean square, and the F statistic for the subgroup is the between subgroup mean square also divided by the within group's mean square. But if you're looking at random effects for your subgroups, we don't really consider the subgroups F statistic, but the F statistic for the main groups is the between group mean square, in this case divided by the between subgroup mean square. So finally, what pieces of information are important when reporting the results of a nested ANOVA? Well, first, it's important to describe the structure of the model used. What were the random effects? What were the fixed effects? Um, you know, go, go through the sort of the model structure. You should report the sample means for any fixed effect main groups that you might have. This is really what we care about. We care about the difference between means among all the groups. This is, you know, how big of an effect it was there. You should also report the various statistical parameters, the F statistic, it's two degrees of freedom, you know, there's degree of freedom one, degree of freedom two for the between groups and the between subgroups mean squares, um, and then the p-value for the fixed effects as well. And this is the information that can help you decide, you know, how likely is it, is there an effect? Can we tell whether the means differ in one way or another or not much at all? The statistical results typically aren't reported for random effects. You know, often, at least in R, you don't get F statistics or p-values for them. We're often not really interested in looking at them. We're treating the random effects as kind of to, to deal with this non-independence. So to wrap up, nested ANOVA could be a good approach, especially if you have sort of simple structured models with maybe, you know, one level of nesting and some random effects. But when the combination of fixed and random effects gets more complicated, or when the assumptions aren't met, and it also you know, becomes harder to meet the assumptions the more complicated the model structure gets, there are other methods that are perhaps better. In particular, there's something called mixed effects models, uh, which I'll cover in a future video. And, and these can be more flexible for more complicated sampling structures, more powerful when the sampling structure is more complicated. You could deal with a lot more fixed and random effects structures. Um, and potentially more robust to assumptions. So, you know, nested ANOVA is, I think, largely or starting to become uh, superseded by mixed effects models, but it can still be useful in, in sort of simple situations where you have very, you know, sort of straightforward nesting and good assumptions being met. Welcome. Now, this video introduces partial and semi-partial correlation. So these techniques are closely related to simple correlation, um, also to regression and, and multiple regression. Uh, if you're not familiar with those, you might want to revisit the, the previous videos on those topics before we, we move ahead. I'll also recap the difference between correlation and regression. Although they're, they're related techniques, the math is, is very similar behind the scenes in many cases, and you can get one from the other. Um, there are, I suppose, philosophical goals or differences in the goals of these, these two methods. So strictly speaking, correlation is to test for association between two variables without any assumption of, of causality. In fact, the variables are often interdependent, um, controlled by some process maybe that we can't measure. 
Regression is, is technically used when you think that one variable is actually causing changes in the other, or you want to predict one variable from measurements of, of the other. In reality, you often see people using these methods interchangeably, um, and, and you'll see from, from this video, partial correlation does kind of blur the lines between strict association and strict causality because of something which you'll learn called the confounding variables. But partial correlation is often quite useful because natural systems can have a lot of interacting or interdependent processes. So as, as an example, the abundance of clouds over the ocean often is correlated with the amount of these tiny particles called aerosols. When there's a lot of aerosols, there's also a lot of clouds, and vice versa. But both aerosols and clouds can be correlated with wind speed. So maybe wind speed could be something called a mediating or a confounding variable. Perhaps some or all of the correlation between aerosols and clouds occurs because both of those two things are actually correlated with the third factor of wind speed. So what we'd really want to know is say what was the strength of correlation between aerosols and clouds after or for accounting for the fact that, that wind speed might affect both of them. So to perform partial correlation, you need two continuous main variables, the one that you're interested the ones you're interested in, and at least one potentially confounding variable. Um, the confounding variable is usually also continuous, but I've seen examples where it's categorical, although these seem to be less common. And I described in the, in the previous slide, the purpose of partial correlation is to test for an association between the two main variables after accounting for or controlling for the effects of a confounding variable or variables. You can do more than one, although it gets complicated. The null hypothesis is that there's no relationship or association between the two main variables after controlling for the confounding variable. So I won't go into too much detail about the mathematics behind this, but basically the, co the correlation coefficient, the partial correlation coefficient between our two variables is the simple correlation coefficient, which is this R A B, the correlation between A and B, adjusted to account for the correlations between each main variable and the confounding variable C. So the correlation between A and C, or R, A, C, and the correlation between B and C. So this is Pearson's partial correlation coefficient, and it has a single confounding variable, and so the equation um, looks like this. Um, for hypothesis testing, the coefficient that you get can be converted into a, something that follows a t-distribution where the degrees of freedom are n, the number of total observations you have, minus 2, minus k, which is the number of confounding variables, so generally n minus 3. Well, in this case, it would be. So another way to think about partial correlations with sort of a graphical Venn diagram example. So imagine this circle shows the range of values of variable b. Well, if we add air variable A, there might be some overlap because some there's some correlation between the two. Some of the variability in B will correlate with or be accounted for by variable A. Right? That's part of the reason we say correlation or regression is that some of variable B is explained by, by variable A. So that's the greenish sort of central overlapping region of these two circles. But in partial correlation, we add a third confounding variable, the red one here, which you can see overlaps with, with all three. And what this does is it reduces the area of this central green area, which is now the variance in B that's accounted for by A after we remove the effects of C. So we basically removed the red wedge, and we're left just with the upper um, greenish wedge that is essentially the, the variance in B accounted for A after you remove C. So in this case, the partial correlation coefficient is smaller than the simple correlation coefficient, um, but that isn't always the case. It can actually increase after considering a confounding variable, in which case the confounding variable is said to suppress the interaction. So another way to think about partial correlation is thinking about it in the context of regression. So it actually, the partial correlation coefficient is really just the same as the simple correlation between the residuals of our variables. So essentially what we have, let's say we take the residuals in a regression of aerosol amount versus wind speed. Remember residuals are the difference between our best fit line, sort of the expected value, and the observed value. So I've highlighted one vertical red line there. So the residuals basically tell us 
what is left over in the aerosol value after accounting for the effects of wind speed, basically what aerosols are versus what they should be given wind speed. We can do the same thing for cloud abundance. We can get the residuals for all those, and then we can plot in the large graph on the right the residuals of cloud abundance after accounting for wind speed and the residuals of aerosols after accounting for wind speed, and then calculate the correlation between those two. So as partial correlation is a relationship between the two variables after accounting for the effect of the confounding variables, that's actually the same thing as the simple correlation between the residuals here. If you do this, you'll find that the p-value for a correlation between the residuals is not the same as the p-value for partial correlation, and that's because in this case we're not dealing with degrees of freedom correctly. You'd have to um, subtract an extra degree of freedom that doesn't get accounted for here. But sort of conceptually speaking, the correlation coefficient that you get, this number between 0 and 1, is the same if you run the partial correlation formula from the previous slide, or if you calculate the cor correlation between the residuals. So the partial correlation is the more commonly used of the two methods. There's also something called semi-partial correlation, and it is quite similar. Um, the basically only difference is that the confounding variable is only thought to influence one of the two main variables and not both of them as in the previous case. So perhaps wind speed affects aerosol amount, but not cloud abundance. So in that case, we could run a semi-partial correlation to assess the correlation between aerosols and clouds while accounting for the confounding effect of wind speeds on aerosol abundance only. In other words, this is basically testing how much aerosols add to cloud abundance, how much aerosols add to our knowledge of cloud abundance, essentially, above and beyond what we'd expect from the effect of wind speeds on aerosols. Do they add anything useful? That's what the semi-partial correlation is basically telling us. So the assumptions for partial correlation and semi-partial correlation are the same as those for simple correlation. Most often you see this in terms of Pearson's partial correlation coefficient. So just like in simple correlation, it assumes a linear relationship, which really means it's not a curved relationship. There's not no serious outlier points. The observations should be independent of each other, which largely means you should have, make sure you're avoiding time series data. Um, potentially data with spatial structure as well. It could be spatial correlation between the points. Each pair of variables should be something called bivariate normal, which is like a two-dimensional normal distribution. So instead of a bell curve, you have sort of like a bell-shaped mountain, like a Hershey's kiss. Um, but in reality, you just typically assess whether each variable is approximately normal on its own. So those assumptions are for the parametric version, but just like for simple correlation, you can do non-parametric partial correlation using the Spearman coefficient or the Kendall coefficient. And this is what you would do in the case that you might have a nonlinear relationship or non-normal, non-parametric variables. So to report the results, you should describe the relationship you're assessing, including the confounding variables. Uh, for semi-partial correlation, you should explain which one of the main variables you think is being influenced by the confounding ones. Now, if you're writing a research paper, this might require a few sentences or some explanation, um, you know, to provide the background and, and the justification. Uh, you know, beyond that, you should, of course, report the partial or semi-partial correlation coefficient. Make sure you say which one you used and um, whether it's the Pearson, the R, spearman drow Kendall's Tau. The correlation coefficient itself is very important because it tells you about the strength of the actual relationship. Of course, you actually report the p-value too. That is sort of the, the statistical significance, which is goes kind of in tandem with the, the strength of the actual relationship. And finally, um, you might include scatter plots to visualize the results. Um, it's complicated here, just like it is in multiple regression, um, because just plotting the two main variables against each other doesn't take into account the confounding variables and how those might change the relationship once they're accounted for. Um, one way to get around that is to take advantage of the similarity between correlation and regression and do the, make that plot of residuals against residuals that shows the effect once you've removed it, but it's a little complicated to explain. So, um, you know, there's often not a plot that is really good for this. And if you have more than one confounding variable, 
it'll be really hard to graph and also to, to describe and interpret. So here's an example of, of how you might phrase this. You know, no significant correlation between aerosols and cloud abundance. After controlling for wind speed, that's our confounding variable. We do a Pearson partial correlation, we get some R value and a, and a P value, for example. The formulas for partial and semi-partial correlation aren't that complicated to make yourself, um, but there's already a package that does both, so might as well take advantage of that. Um, so in the, the, the package ppcore, there's a function called pcore.test for partial correlation. It simply requires each of the main variables, which I call v1 and v2 here, um, as vectors, because they should be a single numeric vector each, um, and the confounding variable um, as a vector, if there's one of them, or as a data frame, if there's more than one. You can choose um, Spearman or Kendall if you need to do a non-parametric partial correlation, just using the method equals, and it can be abbreviated method equals S or K if you, if you want. Um, and finally, um, the function spcore.test is for semi-partial semi correlation, um, and it works the same way, the same format, the three variables. Uh, you can use method equals Spearman if you want, um, but in this case note that the, the confounding variable only influences the second of the two main variables, so you're basically looking at how variable one is called very t variable two, accounting for the effect of the confounding variable on variable two. In previous videos on correlation or regression methods, I've mentioned that time series data cause problems with those types of tests. So time series is one where measurements are made over time. Every minute, you know, every day, every year. Um, in the geosciences, we often have time series because we're looking at values in different geological time periods or measured through a sediment core, uh, you know, that also reflects time. You can run into similar problems with data that are collected spatially, but basically any situation where the value of one point is going to be somewhat related to the values of nearby points. If one is high, its neighbors are also likely going to be high. But if you're comparing time series data that have strong directional trends, there's a very good chance that you're going to find a relationship or a correlation, but that relationship will be spurious. So that means it looks like there's a strong relationship, but it's only there because both are increasing through time, or both are, both are decreasing through time. Or you could have a negative relationship if one increases and the other decreases. So in some cases, as in the example here, the relationship is clearly, and in this case humorously, spurious. Uh, but that's not always going to be the case. It's not always going to be obvious that the two things aren't related to each other. So we need to deal with this in some way when working with directional time series. But time series don't have to have long-term trends, and that brings up the idea of stationary versus non-stationary. So time series is called stationary, using it in the wide sense of the term, if its mean, and some other parameters that are less important for us here, um, is constant over the series. Now, this time series is stationary because even though you can see the values are fluctuating, they go up and down, they, they zigzag around, um, but there's no long-term trend in the average or mean value of this time series. In contrast, non-stationary time series have mean values that aren't constant. In the example here, the mean value increases over time. Um, of course, there are still these fluctuations, but the mean is increasing, which is sort of an especially problematic type of non-stationarity because it often leads to these spurious relationships or correlations. So what to do with time series data? Well, one very simple option is to do something called differencing the data. So instead of doing a correlation or a regression on the raw data values, we're going to use the change in value from one point in the time series to the next point. So this is called the first difference because it's the difference between adjacent points, only one point apart. Uh, it's possible to look at other differences. There's a second difference. Um, you know, between points that are two apart, a third difference, and so forth. Um, but really, first differences is what are almost always used because they're always they're almost always what you what is all needed to be used. So, for example, um, the first difference between this point here in the green time series and this point here, the one just before it, is just 0.5. 
the value of one minus the value of the other. So it's the change from one point to the next. So basically the first difference is just instead of looking at raw data, we're looking at change. So we look at all pairs of points um, along here to get our time, our, our time series of first differences instead. So the, the basis or the rationale for this process is that if there is a relationship, a truly a true relationship that's not just caused by the fact that they both increase over time, an increase in one variable should occur at the same time as an increase in the other. When one increases by a lot, the other should as well. If one decreases by a small amount, the other should decrease by a small amount. So taking the first difference tends to make each time series stationary. Doesn't necessarily do that. There still could be other patterns as well, such as seasonal or other trends. But first differences or difference in the data typically make most time series stationary. So here's an example of, of how you might use it. So looking on the left, when these two time series are plotted next to each other, with their values both increasing through time, it really looks like there's a strong relationship. You look and oh yeah, I mean those are definitely related. That's one goes up, so does the other. But let's take this pair of points here. The green series increases by quite a large amount, but the purple series actually decreases by a lot. So that, that pair of points, if we do the first differences, corresponds to this. A fairly large change in green and a, and a negative change in purple on the x-axis there. In this pair, at the very beginning, the purple time series goes up by a lot and the green one goes down by a little. And so that corresponds to this point over here a large positive increase on the x-axis for purple and a small negative increase on the y-axis for the green series. So if you look overall at these points, after doing the first differences, which is what's plotted on the right, there doesn't actually appear to be much of a relationship after all. So what should you do with time series beyond just doing differences? So the first step is to consider your scientific goal. So if you think there is a scientific reason why one variable should cause changes in the other, but not the reverse, or if your goal is to predict one variable from the other, but not the reverse again, then regression is probably appropriate. If, there's, if you think there's just an association between the variables, perhaps they're both related to some external factor, then some kind of correlation is appropriate. Next, let's consider the nature of the time series. So for correlation tests, Regardless of whether the time series is stationary or non-stationary, we want to perform the correlation on the first differences rather than on the raw data. So you can do simple correlation, you can do a partial correlation, you can do semi-partial correlation with the difference data. You know, all these methods are available to you. But you should plot the first differences as a scatter plot, one variable versus the other, um, to choose between parametric and non-parametric correlation. So not the raw data, but if the relationship between the first differences is curved, or if the first differences themselves are not normally distributed, then you can run a non-parametric correlation. So if you're doing regression and the time series is non-stationary, you can do just a regular ordinary least squares regression but on the first differences again instead of the raw values. Make sure that the other assumptions are still met. Check that differencing has removed any autocorrelation of the residuals. It most likely has, but not necessarily. Make sure that the relationship of the first differences is a linear relationship if you're doing a linear regression and, and so forth. Finally, if you're doing regression and the time series is stationary, you can use a technique called generalized least squares regression which I have a separate video on, so I won't go into here. But it's also totally fine to do, in this case, ordinary least squares regression on the first differences, just like you would otherwise. So you can, you know, to wrap up here, beware of time series, especially non-stationary time series, because they can cause problems. If both of your variables are both strongly increasing or decreasing, or both have some kind of strong trend, well, there's a very good chance that you're looking at a correlation or, or, or a relationship in regression that is inflated, perhaps even spurious or false. There are a lot more sophisticated methods for this, especially once you get into the, the economics um, literature, but working with first differences is a simple but powerful approach for working with time series, so always do the differences of your time series.